Uh, hi, everybody, and welcome to the uh, next session of RightsCon, where we're going to talk about uh, privacy by design and laws and companies and whether companies are doing privacy by design and, and how to improve things. We've got a bunch of interesting panelists. We've got Isabella Bagueros from the Tor Project. We've got uh, Harlow Holmes from, uh, her title is Director of Newsroom Digital Security, Freedom of the Press Foundation, which uh, sounds like she talks to actual users and helps real people. Uh, and then we've got Haley Tsukayama with, from EFF, uh, who can help us on the legal side. And, um, uh, and hi, I'm Roger Dingledine, also from Tor. Uh, you might notice that I'm not Dan Meredith. Dan has a uh, like a one-week-old baby at this point, so I am your replacement Dan for the afternoon. Okay, so um, we're going to talk today about privacy by design and uh, what that means and whether laws and society and big companies, how they play into that. And I imagine we're going to start off sort of pessimistic because the world's kind of a crappy place these days and hopefully we'll end on some optimistic points of how we can actually uh, make things better and uh, live more in the world that we want to live in. So with that, um, let's start off on the law side. Uh, Haley, so I hear California has a new law about privacy or something. Can you tell us more about what that is? Um, sure, I know a little bit about that. Um, so I should I should say up front. Um, so yeah, my title at EFF is legislative activist. I am not a lawyer, but I do work on our legislative team. Um, I'm actually a journalist by background. So uh, I've been at EFF about two years. Um, so yeah, the California Consumer Privacy Act um, was actually passed in 2019, um, went into effect at the beginning of 2020. Uh, enforcement started uh, July 1st. So it's been a long and graduated process. Um, it basically in terms of how, how it relates to consumers, it grants three basic rights. So you get the right to know what information companies have about you, the right to delete that information, and the right to tell your companies not to sell that information. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, um, it is probably the, it's, I would say the most comprehensive state privacy law that we've seen. Um, I think, you know, from EFF's perspective, it's a really good foundation. There are many things we would like to build upon it, um, which I think would be in line with the principles of privacy by design. Um, you know, we were really pushing for some data minimization, kind of purpose limitation language. Um, and CCPA itself does not actually address design that much. Um, the law does direct the AG to come up with a sort of universal opt-out logo, um, which is an ongoing uh, topic of conversation. Um, and so it brings up a lot of design questions in terms of how companies should implement, but it doesn't actually um, get that prescriptive in terms of the actual law. Okay, so we've got uh, laws that tell us we should be better without specifying quite what they mean or how we should be better. That's a, an interesting way to start these things. So Isa, let me bring you into this. Uh, so laws by themselves aren't good enough. We need uh, actual tools that actually keep us safe, or we need social structures that allow us to have that. Tell us more. What do we need besides a law? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Raja. I feel that we do need to understand the motivation, right? Like, what is the motivation to apply such a change? And in, in the way we are right now, the motivation is very low from the um, from the private sector, right? Because there was a whole business model built on the top of a certain type, you know, of like data collection and data trading and also like behavioral analysis and so forth, right? Like, so um, then we'll be always put it up uh, first in pigments because uh, the motivation here is the money, right? Like is the profit. Like if I'm changing, even not changing my business model, but just complying with the law, with like in this case, the CPA, people complain. So GDPR, people complain. They say like, oh, that is a cost. You know, there is a cost to do the change. There is a cost for consultation with a lawyer, and et cetera, right? Like, and uh, I like to draw the parallel with all the things going on in our lives. You know, like we have seen the same speech for uh, legislation regarding climate change, you know, like, and here we are, right? Like we are, like we are in, desperation mode for, you know, people to actually adopt those practices and like start changing the uh, behavior. So I feel like it's very similar with the privacy, you know, like in the internet, 
and how things are dealt and the data that is collected about our behavior and you know what uh, governs on the top of this data. So I think uh, the motivation is a huge thing here to take into consideration. And you know we need to reflect on how to change this motivation as well. You know I think like changing the business model is part of this. There are uh, projects out there, you know, protocols like Interledge, you know, uh, you know, where people are doing a different type of uh, web monetization, you know, and distribution of money for content providers and those who are, you know, the client, the customers here, right? Like who's reading those with the user and who's uh, accessing that product. So I think um, we need to rethink that too. It's not just about the law, it's not just about the compliance, but about changing the whole uh, way of doing business as well. But otherwise, the interpretation is so much open in the air, you know, like, and they can interpret this as we saw when the law got in effect, you know, in multiple ways. There was even companies saying, oh, if you want those rights, we're going to lock down your account and they don't have access to anything that you produce it with this tool, you know? So is that right? You know, like, is that is still guaranteeing my right? I don't think so. So I think it's like, we also, uh, that's where uh, privacy by design comes in, you know, like uh, removing the burden from the user and also removing the motivation that created this problem to begin with, you know. That's a little bit where I'm coming from with the idea that we need to also change um, much more than just, uh, you know, pass a law. We need to also go deeper into the business model of it as well. Okay, so step one. Uh, have a law that actually clarifies how what it means for people to be safe. Step two, change the surveillance capitalism business model so that uh, the large companies will actually have user safety in mind. Speaking of users, so uh, Harlow, a lot of uh, what you work on uh, touches actual people, journalists and so on, in terms of, of using things successfully, usability, uh, user experience, all those words. So, I mean, if I'm a user, I I try to install the right software on my phone. I try to uh, not do this. And then suddenly I walk outside and there's a surveillance camera. So there's so many different ways that I can get screwed. How how should I, as a user, be thinking about this? How do I, how do I balance? How do I not just, you know, throw up my hands and give up? Very good question. Um, and it's, it's often really, really hard to come to an answer that fits everyone. And so, um, at Freedom of the Press Foundation, our methodology as trainers, when we go into newsrooms to instruct people on how to use tools, we tend to focus definitely on how to use the tools because it's important to use them correctly to go through the defaults. And depending on the tool that you're using, some are defined or some are uh, designed with simple defaults that preserve your privacy. And then others are designed to do exactly the opposite, which is incredibly frustrating. And so we do have to like learn how to use every tool, know exactly like where the pitfalls and the gotchas are and um, help users out that way. But another very important uh, component of our training methodology has to do with the fact that uh, you're never going to, um, you're never always going to have like a digital security trainer sitting on your shoulder and helping you, um, you know, make decisions for yourself. Uh, and so it's important to teach people to be like as a uh, I guess, nimble and critical and think as critically as possible in order to make those decisions on their own. So it's not only important to know, like, for instance, on Facebook, right, where to, you know, like, uh, turn off a certain setting that allows you not to be discoverable in a certain way. Um, but it's also really important to know that, like, from a surveillance capitalism perspective, just about any app that you use um, that is, like, financially motivated is going to try to do the same thing. And so having that in your mind um, as you make your own decisions, going through whatever setting on whatever app that you use uh, is uh, incredibly useful. So once again, um, it's uh, definitely like focusing on the tools that we have, but also knowing that the tools are going to change, people's priorities are going to change. And so giving them the, the, uh, the skill set that they need in order to think through um, how to address privacy and security based off of um, whatever it is they're using. So teaching users how to actually reason about security and recognize whether they're getting something that is going to keep them safe or not. Precise. So we, we, we've talked about privacy by design. I heard the phrase privacy by default at one point. Can, can some one or more of you 
get more concrete here? What do we mean by privacy by design? Are there examples like what what is privacy by design versus privacy not by design? Can I can jump in? Can I jump in? All right. So I'm going to start and please complete me, uh, the other panelists. But I feel that like uh, when it means privacy by design is that when you're designing the software, you know, you are, you have the user privacy in mind and you are uh, creating the way it will work with, uh, you know, minimizing data collection, minimum, minimizing like exposure of data, you probably will not want to hold data for too long. If you need a little bit of data to make a feature work, you know, you're probably just going to use that to make that feature work. And then eventually it's going to be, you know, like erase it for real, like not erase it, you know, is erase it from your device, but is it in the cloud or something like that, you know, like, so I feel um, that type of uh, thinking when you are designing your software is what we mean by privacy by design, right? Like what are the features that you are creating that will provide this layer, you know, like it will uh, make your, um, your product, you know, uh, behave in a way that respects the data of the users. And you can create business model on the top of that, you know, like what I described it is a little bit of how Signal works and Signal is a nonprofit. But also, it's a little bit about the, the goal, you know, like, and it's a for-profit, and they're quite like you're making money, you know, like they're lucrative. So there are business created with that mind, and you can still make money with uh, Brave is building a way of web monetization as well, you know, that is not based on advertising and, you know, collection of data. So I think that is other, like, uh, people thinking out of the box because literally uh, folks are very tired of that. Um, but privacy by default, I feel uh, for me, my interpretation is that um, you still have another option, you know, like that is the default option, but you can opt it out for other options, you know, like, uh, and I feel that, uh, I don't know, like, uh, that's my interpretation on that difference between the design and the default is, uh, you know, you have more than one options and the default is the private, the private, the more private, one, you know, like, uh, so it's kind of like uh, you still would have to go to settings to customize it if you want, like in a way or another. But the difference is that normally you have to go to settings to make it more private. And by default, would be like the more private would be the first option. Pause to let Haley or Harlow jump in with other concrete examples if they have uh, favorite things they like describing for designs that actually uh, work and are good examples. Yeah. Um I like to think about like the, the, the browser wars actually, or like, you know, the way that they are right now, like the fundamental differences between um, how Chrome and Firefox and Brave as Isabella mentioned and uh, Opera even like operate. Um, also you can throw Safari in the mix uh, is an incredibly interesting study, albeit like maybe a little bit boring, <laughs> but whatever. Um, uh, when you think about like privacy by design versus um, uh, uh, the opposite of that, um, the fact that, you know, fundamentally like Mozilla has like staked so much in being like champions of privacy, that is seen in the defaults that they expose to users the minute that they install the software on their computer. And then conversely, when you take a look at Chrome, although Chrome is getting a lot better because they have had a lot of pushback from members of the security and privacy advocacy space. Um, so like kudos to everybody in the Zoom room, right? Um, but uh, earlier, um, Chrome had a lot of problems with the uh, their insecurity defaults, or rather they focus more on security and kudos to them, but like as, term, as far as privacy is concerned, because it was like so tied into the Google ecosystem and we know that their business model is that they're an advertising company before they're anything else and so the way that that was like a very easy pipeline for, um, to get user data uh, was really really alarming and it took a lot of pushback in order for google to actually understand that that was affecting users and that we actually cared about it um, before they implemented the changes that we needed to see everyone still has a lot of work to do but uh, that is like a perfect textbook example, I think, of what we're talking about. I like the phrase privacy by promise as the opposite of privacy by design, where it's not actually the technology that keeps you safe. It's somebody writing a sentence down and hoping you believe it where the actual technology doesn't work that way. 
Haley, did you want to jump in or should we go to the next? I'll let you choose. Um, well, yeah. So I just, you know, just one thing that I want to add. So definitely, you know, just building on what you we, you all said, I think another thing that we think about a lot at EFF where we, you know, we also design products um, in addition to our advocacy work um, is, you know, just making sure that when people are going through uh, a process of any kind that, you know, the choice feels meaningful in the way that it's presented. So it's not just, you know, a huge button that says, you know, let us take your data and then a tiny link at the bottom that says, or not. Um, and so also just in the actual presentation, just having choice built into it and designed into it in a way that feels equal. Um, a lot of design is about nudging users in one way or another, right, to make sure that they, they understand how the flow goes, but um, just making sure that privacy is actually a meaningfully presented choice in, in those kinds of situations. So that ties into one of the questions that we've gotten in the chat. Uh, so the big companies right now, all of their incentives are set up for continuing the surveillance capitalism model. They're set up for, we collect your data and we profit from it. And here we are talking about privacy by design. Wouldn't it be cool if they had a different business model or different products? How do we get from here to there? Are we, is the goal that we say, hey, Amazon, you need to change. And then Amazon realizes that actually profiting from big data sets isn't what they should do and they change? Or do we say, hey, Amazon, uh, you need to become defunct. You need to get out competed by this other uh, approach that has people safer by default, by design. How do we get from here to there? Do we, do we make the big companies change? Do we replace them? What, how does this work? I am very pessimistic about that. I, I'll let like everybody else weigh in first, um, but I just want to start out by saying like I am so pessimistic about that, especially when we're talking about Amazon. Yeah, but I mean, they're all based on collect a large data set and then use machine learning to get smarter than other people. And the way you know a, a successful company is they have the largest data set. That's very true. That's very true. Um, something that I think is uh, really scary about this era of surveillance capitalism that we are just starting to, to live in um, is that there is no longer, um, or, and this is once again, an incredibly pessimistic view, but it's my view. Uh, we are without choice and choice is disappearing. Um, it will take a lot for someone to compete with Amazon. And the reason why is because Amazon does myriad things. Not only are they, you know, like our go-to, um, you know, uh, like stuff provider, uh, but they also are represented in things like Whole Foods and the fact that they bought Zappos, you know, and like Goodreads, I think, or whatever. Um, but also like the data that's represented in um, surveillance architecture, which is like ring cameras and any other like attended technologies, including like the facial recognition and things like that. Um, what's interesting about that is that you might want to say like, if I wanted to compete, or if I wanted to um, make Amazon compete more for my trust as a consumer, I would, instead of buying a ring camera, I would buy a Nest, let's say, or like a product made by like TP-Link or D-Link or whatever. Um, okay, that's your choice as a consumer. But what if it gets to the point where um, in order to move into this building as a tenant, you have no um, say whatsoever. And there's just ring cameras and stored on in your hallways, in your lobbies, you know, like outside of your front door because you don't get the choice um, you, because you're a tenant. And now it's the real estate developers who might actually have to make that choice on your behalf. And they're probably going to be more, um, or they're going to have less comp competition. Um, they're going to have less of uh, like a, an impetus to look for competition. They're just going to go with Amazon. And so like, not only do you as a user um, lose your ability to, to um, participate in choice making like a consumer would, but also if you're going to put a dollar amount on what people's data is worth, and that is a fact that all of these companies are very, very cognizant of, you, get, you actually don't even own that data. Perhaps your landlord owns that data. So there's... My pessimistic view is that like, we are uh, losing, as individuals, a lot of choice in the matter. Isa, Haley, let me try to reframe this for you. Not do we want a better world, but how do we actually get there? Like, do, do we replace the big companies? Do we get them to change? Do, do either of those work? Um, so I can start. Um, I think you know everything Arlo said makes a lot of sense, and I totally understand why there's a pessimistic uh, worldview 
out there. I certainly uh, feel it on some mornings when I wake up. Um, I think, you know, one way that legislation can help is sort of setting this floor for saying, um, you know, that these are types of like types of behaviors that are OK by, by, by companies and these are types of behaviors that aren't OK. This is such a complicated issue. You know, Harlow talked a lot about competition. I think, you know, we do have to think about that, too, right, from a legislative perspective. And a lot of people are thinking about a lot of pieces of this and how it all comes together to really set a baseline for what we find acceptable as consumers, as Americans, you know, in terms of like Ring is a great example of like how they share with law enforcement. Like, are we all okay with that? Do we actually agree to that relationship? Um, And so just sort of looking at how legislation can set this baseline and then how we can all build on it. I, yes, I, I tend to be more optimistic. I don't know if it's a Brazilian thing. <laughs> Somebody needs to. I know, Please right? Do. But I, I kind of like, I, I go through this process, like in my life, in my mindset, right? Like I know legislation helps, but legislation is only built through struggle. It doesn't, like, the legislator is not going to write that law if it, there is no struggle behind it, if there is no activism behind it. There's no people out in the city. We only discuss right now, for instance, we're only discussing the police budget in this country because of the rebellion. You know, if there is no people in the streets, if there is no struggle behind it, nothing's going to pass. You know, like, so that's like a, the work of the FF and so many activists is like being like the CCPA was open for comments, you know, and being there, writing the comments, you know, questioning, that's like pushing and making that happen. And that such a law was created with GDPR, with CCPA. This trend exists because also there was a demand and a struggle and also a rejection from the consumer. Money hurts, you know, like I remember when Snowden came out and um, all the CEOs only went to talk with the president about, you know, it was when the Brazilian said, oh, we're gonna, you, you all have to keep your data here in your country. And that would cost so much money for Twitter, for Facebook to do that, that they travel right away to our house and they were like, we need to talk. Because you know? <laughs> like, it's all about the money. You know? like, so anyways, uh, so I think like this is the, the process is through that. But I also like, I, I suggested just Spaniel because I know like the interpretation of the legislation is still, you know, like up in the air. And I think uh, we still have a lot of work here to do. And like I compared with uh, the climate change because I also like the story of the seatbelt. If you look at the story of the seatbelt, no one in the industry wanted to have the seatbelt. They denied that that would cause death of people, whatever. The same thing with the cigarettes. But the seatbelt, you know, like it became indeed a regulation and the people building cars, they had to have the seatbelt, the safety for the driver. Not only that, but it's not like, oh, you adapted that the way you want. You put like a thing on your forehead and that's the seatbelt. No, there are points, there are studies where like if something happened and the seatbelt is not falling, that scientific, you know, uh, physics, you know, like points that you need to be holding in your body, then, you know, you, they are sued because they didn't build the product with the safety that the law requires. So I'm kind of like, you know, I think uh, w- w- the privacy by design and the user data, we're still far away, you know, like I, I also compare that in the United States, in like here in the United States, you all don't have uh, labor laws, but in other countries you do, and it's in the federal level. So every employment you have, you'll have guaranteed vacation, guaranteed maternity leave, you know, you have guaranteed certain things because it's like federal, you know, here is like up in the air. Every time I have a new job, I have new rights. You know, because like, I'm negotiating the terms of my contract and privacy right now is what it is. You know, like every time I have a new app, I have new rights and it cannot be this way because we're just not talking about a random product. We're talking about when we, I, I'm really happy that the narrative around the understanding of privacy have changed because in 2013, a lot of people would be like, oh, I have nothing to hide. And after seeing the power of changing the context, the social context where you are, by using the behavior data that you, you know, like is being sold and traded all over there and understanding things like computer analytics and other things like that, people change their mind. And then when you talk about privacy, they say, yes, it's what makes me the human being I am. And what defines the human being I am. And people are exploring that. And they are, just to finish, they are indeed exploring because if you dig into the Trans-Pacific you know, agreement that went down and didn't went through, 
one of the things that they uh, narrate about the benefits of the agreement was that was going to weaken the privacy laws in Europe. And that was going to grow the GDP from European countries because it would make my money with trades with the tech companies, whatever. And I heard the same story back in the day in the 90s and early 2000s when free trade agreement in South America was passing. And, you know, they used to say that uh, the profit would grow because environment laws would be weakened by the trade agreements and they could explore, you know, the natural resources. So our behavior data became a natural resource to be explored too, you know, like and has a huge value on it, you know, just to finish. So I'm, seeing, I, I'm hearing two competing narratives here. One of them uh, on the good side is check out these cool laws like the California privacy law and GDPR and so on that are, I mean, maybe they're not perfect or maybe they're not actually helping that much in, in substance, but they're, they're trying. Uh, and in the past, we have examples where governments provide social safety nets or say this is uh, seatbelts are important for the world, so we're going to mandate them. Uh, and then there's another narrative, which is, uh, but oh my God, when people have encryption, then the bad people will take over and the world will be destroyed because people will have encryption and we need to take that away from them. Uh, I, I mean, from the rights con world, I think we're, we're squarely on the, no, everybody should have safety and the ability to keep themselves safe. But are we, I mean, I, I guess I shouldn't ask the pessimistic question of uh, which, which, which narrative is going to succeed. But I guess I'll, I'll try to uh, ask the better one of how do we make our narrative succeed when like the Department of Justice and the European equivalents and China and so on, they all have pretty good PR departments talking about how important it is for social safety to be able to watch everything and see everything. How do we make sure that our narrative is the one that comes out on top? Um, also, I would like to uh, just say that um, CCPA is a huge win and something that we all as Americans should be proud of. However, uh, the structure behind that is only possible because California is just like a ratter state than like just about any other state <laughs> that we have here, um, even though I say this as a true born and bred New Yorker. Um, what California did to bring us uh, CCPA is... Um, very unique and doesn't happen a lot, but there might be ways that we can replicate that model. I'm not a DC person, so like I kind of don't know how that works. And, but I also am, um, uh, my, a lot of my pessimism does come from the fact that uh, lobbying efforts are so strong uh, within these big companies uh, to prevent, you know, the, the, um, the fire from, uh, uh, the spark from California from catching on elsewhere in the country. So, but if we can work on that, and that might mean like, you know, just like going to vote um, and doing other things, um, we might be able to change that tide. Yeah, so Haley, how do we walk us through? California makes a law, step two happens, step three happens, then the US makes a law, what, what's in between? Um, so, I mean, you know, I don't have a crystal ball, so I don't fully know uh, everything that we could do, but I can tell you what we are doing, which is, you know, uh, as Harlow um, intimated, you know, once California passed, we did hear from a lot of other state legislatures saying, hey, we know that consumer privacy is an issue for our constituents. Um, and that's one piece, too, is like, I know it's hard to believe, but um, they do listen to their constituents sometimes in overwhelming numbers against companies. <laughs> so that's one way. That's one thing that we definitely have to do. Um, and I think, you know, right now we've we've also seen the, um, the privacy. Uh, well, pre-COVID, we saw the privacy debate kick off in DC again. Um, this is a very strange year uh, because of the pandemic and so legislative priorities have shifted quite a bit. Um, but I do think, um, you know, we are seeing a lot of states consider laws. Um, you know, we've seen states put forward kind of narrow COVID uh, focused privacy laws, uh, establishing some of these data minimization, purpose limitation kind of rules, you know, saying, because I think people are are looking at sort of the health data being collected in, in this pandemic and saying, but wait, how are you going to use that? And who else is going to get access to that? So I think it's in some ways kind of crystallized the problem in that particular way. Um, and so we have seen some of these laws come up. So, you know, um, and yeah, I think eventually, um, you know, we do hope that we'll see enough states adopt strong laws uh, that it will prompt the, the, 
you know, something on a national scale so that everybody is protected. Um, we certainly wouldn't want to see the federal government pass anything that weakens any of the state laws. So that's an ongoing conversation. But um, yeah, that's sort of the path. And it will take a very long time. Um, but I do think I do see the momentum shifting. Um, and I do hear from a lot of, you know, normal people who are willing to go into their legislator's office and talk. And I know that Calls matter, letters matter. It doesn't feel like it, but when they come in volume, they actually do sway, um, you know, they do sway legislators. So that's an interesting point that uh, the optimistic version is that the federal law helps us. And the pessimistic version is that the federal law squashes whatever progress we've managed to make so far at the state level. So one of the other questions from chat that, that you might be able to help us with. So we mentioned the California Privacy Act uh, and we've got GDPR. Is there a third one or are we just holding up two as examples? Like what else is there around the world that we should be pointing to, if anything? Brazil passed one that is not good and they keep uh, also <laughs> like uh, changing yep. it. So <laughs> yes, um, yeah, it has a, they call it the privacy law, but it has not like, it's extremely far away from a CCPA or GDPR, you know, like, uh, I want to, um, if I can, just talk a little bit about encryption and criminalization because I feel that is also something important and folks were asking about it. Um, you know, like I have a say in Tor, like our, our slogan is optimize, don't criminalize, you know, like don't block Tor, IP addresses, you know, create our own address, make it better for the user coming from Tor, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think uh, it's very important to pay attention to these, you know, the debates and what is going on, because it is, uh, you know, the typical contradictions of governments, right? Like one side moving one way and another side moving the other. And um, the attempt of criminalizing uh, encryption and, uh, you know, the, the civilian use of encryption, right? Like that's the criminalization. They don't mind having the military use of encryption. <laughs> like it's the civilian use of encryption that is criminalized. And, uh, you know, like I feel that um, we, we need to be very strong with that. You know, I feel that um, we need to defend, we need to educate people. We have been in embracing a huge uh, uh, journey at all, like uh, to try to get people to understand things, like very simple things, like there is no dark web, you know, like if we actually stop to think about it, like the definition of it, and you look at like the facts and the information, you know, like it doesn't match, you know, like when people claim that it's like this huge, vast uh, bottle of the iceberg of like crime, crime happening, you know, in, instead of like whatever, if you think the dark web is the Tor network, but it's not, you know, like what they, the, the, the technology that we're doing is actually uh, extremely important for people. And I want to just give you an example of the difference, like uh, uh, for onion servers, right? Like that they try to criminalize so bad, you know, uh, many tools provide end-to-end -end encryption of content. But not that many tools can also obfuscate or completely eliminate the metadata. And you all, everybody like who looks a little bit about how surveillance works and like how they like, uh, you know, do uh, not only like uh, government surveillance, but even the capitalist surveillance. I work in a product as a product manager in a growth team instead of Twitter. I know like how we fashion, like we use data and we manipulate data, people's behavior, you know, like to get them to do, to click a button, you know, to do something to give us some information, you know, because of whatever reason, right? Like, or even to just be addicted to the product, you know, like create like the little loop that they always come back. But, uh, you know, I think um, that um, the onion service is hiding this metadata that gives away so much information about you. And it's such an easy plug and play type of technology, you know, like that you can put on your website and by default also helps with the convention of a uh, you know censorship convention you know like you can build on the top of it there are um, app, apps call it like onion share and it works just like a dropbox but there is no third party server there is no metadata you know everything is hidden how important it is for a lawyer who is talking with uh, you know people who's giving information about human rights violation that they exchange that information without nobody knowing who is giving them and who is asking who, you know, for that information. Uh, and other details is like, a, 
chat, you know, like I give this example to people, but like, um, you know, I train people, I teach my friends, everybody on being safe. And I have friends who, because of the change on the immigration policy in the United States, have to put the parents in different houses because, you know, afraid of them going to that address to get the parents because they were born here, but the parents don't have paper, you know? And they were talking with them with Signal. And I know a correlation of the phone numbers and all of that can give the location, you know, if someone really wanted, you know? And I feel like uh, if we had things that would be for scale, you know, and hides the metadata, you know, we have a, a chat client called Ricochet, which works for desktop, not yet for mobile, but like uh, that would be way more safer for my friend to be talking, especially that we know for a fact that ICE does look at phone data, does use Stingray, or does use those kind of tools to lo locate um, immigrants and deport them. So I just want to give you examples of how important real encryption and heavy encryption it is for uh, civil society and to defend that and not criminalize that. Great. So decentralized is way better than centralized and tools that, uh, that don't need to collect information are much safer than tools whose business model and funding model is about collecting the information. Somebody on chat added uh, another notion. There's the Nigeria Data Protection Regulation 2019. So I imagine uh, a lot of countries out there have things like this. Isa mentioned Brazil has one, but, but you shouldn't go look at it because it's not uh, an example of one that you want. So I guess the, the question there is, we've got a bunch of uh, authoritarian and growing authoritarian regimes around the world. And, and I can name you know, 20 countries at this point, we're gonna be you know, talking Turkey and so on. Uh, so here we are talking about uh, Europe and the US uh, or at least Europe and California, I should clarify, uh, and in terms of, of how to make society safer through laws to, to regulate how companies can behave. But at the same time, we've got countries out there who are, you know, you there over and over we see examples of Middle Eastern countries uh, bringing in European companies and American companies and deploying their stuff, and they're not doing it to help their people. So how is there a way to make these California specific and Europe specific regulations matter to the rest of the people in the world? Or is this just California people talking about themselves? Uh, oh, go ahead, Haley. you go. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> All right, well, I mean, I just had a, something very brief to say, which is uh, it's been a long time um, since, or, hmm, I feel a different energy nowadays than I did, let's say, five years ago uh, regarding making people around the world care about these things. And I think part of that has to do with, um, and this is once again like a usability question, like, you know, the apps that we have, like TikTok is the most popular app in the world right now. Like, why? Why is TikTok? I mean, from a privacy perspective, like TikTok is like pretty much like the worst app. And also, um, you know, uh, uh, companies that, uh, in other countries have different stances towards privacy as far as users are concerned. And also they haven't learned the growing pains that a Google or a Facebook have learned um, for better or for worse because they were out of the gate, you know, like eight, 10 years ago. Um, and so we're going to have to do a lot of like uh, re popularizing these concepts and recirculating these concepts in order to get people to care because I mean like quite frankly like all of these statutes the the ones that exist like C, uh, GDPR um, CCPA what you mentioned in Brazil or um, Nigeria and all of these things like they're not going to offer even coverage for everybody on the planet and a lot of them uh, are hard to implement as they as they are and a lot of them are just playing lip service to the idea so um yeah, I guess like the, you know, like the, the, the next pillar is like, you know, reinvigorating um, people's enthusiasm and caring about these concepts. Really? Um, well, you just said what I wanted to say so much better than I could have said it. But, um, you know, I, I do think there is, um, you know, again, just sort of just talking about What's in our control is, you know, is legislation, well, you know, in terms of my job, like what's in my control is advocating for legislation here in the US, in states at the federal level. 
And just, again, using that as a, a way to establish a baseline to say that, you know, okay, we, we do have these huge companies here, right? So if we can say, look, if we can get you to buy into these standards, hopefully that propagates, you know, it's like, I, I don't have power to change laws in other countries. Um, but, uh, you know, I do have some control. And so you can kind of work with that and work with, with the communities to, to kind of really, again, as you said, like reinvigorate the, the conversation around this um, and see what we can do to, to amplify that and, and protect more people. Can I, can I just add one little thing? While we wait until we get to a point that everything changes and affect everybody in the world, there are tools out there like Tor <laughs> and the Tor browser, you know, that can, you know, like reinforce those rights when you're using the internet for, for yourself, you know, like, so we don't need, you know, to be exposed and give up on our rights. We can enforce those rights by adopting certain tools as well. So I think that uh, is a, it's a good hack for the society while we're waiting for it <laughs> to get there. So that's yeah. definitely a vote for uh, rather than changing the huge companies, just build around them. I, I well, one, um, I just recently taught a whole bunch of journalists to use Onion Share, and they were like, oh, we wanted to do like X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, just like, do, go with what works and what's going to keep you safe. Use Onion Share. And they're like, all right, fine. And so now they're doing it. Um, which is great. Um, but uh, also, I think that uh, this is a, um, an opportunity for us as like the RightsCon community to be introspective about um, the concessions that we have made. And some of them are good concessions. Some of them have um, resulted in like very, very fruitful partnerships. But also like, uh, you know, like Facebook, Twitter, Google, like they're in the room, you know, and we, uh, I feel like so many years ago, we would laugh them out of the room but now they're in the room um and so uh i don't have any like you know grand like uh burn it down kind of like a thing to say but i think that we should re remember um no matter which project you're working on no matter like you know which part of internet freedom you are championing even if you are in washington dc lobbying all day or if you are in silicon valley like typing all day um just remember that remember like why this community is important. Mm -hmm. So speaking of opportunities for introspection, here we are talking on Zoom rather than sitting in the same room in an actual city. Uh, does the COVID crisis help us introspect more? Are we, I mean, on the one hand, we're, we're in a position to, to really understand how internet privacy is and global life privacy. It's not just a cyber thing. Now it's everything. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, we've been saying that for years and, and why is now different. So it, is there something, is there something we can do with the, the last couple of months to, to help us succeed at this fight? Um, see, you can tell I just don't like silence. So I'm just going to talk. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I do think in, in some ways, um, there are there are things about this situation that can help us. So one, I sort of mentioned already, it's um, it's been a good, not good, it's been a test balloon for talking about other, you know, talking about the way that data are used, talking about the way that, you know, this, this economy, this, um, this web of, of data flows works, um, and talking about why privacy is so important, why it's so important to trust, um, particularly with public health initiatives to establish trust with these companies um, so that you get participation, right? Because public health initiatives don't work without participation. So I do think it, it provides, um, again, it can be crystallizing uh, in, in a way for, for people to think about it. Um, the other thing I found uh, perversely perhaps is that it's actually a little bit easier to get people um, in a virtual room than it is in a in a in a real room, right? Um, I don't know that I could have come to to be on this panel uh, if if we had to be in a in a real room because you know I would have had to fly there and all that kind of stuff. So um, I do think it's it's a little bit easier right now when everyone's in the mindset of like, okay, we're going to connect virtually. We don't have to physically be co located somewhere um, to organize and talk about issues. Um, of course, it's a little difficult to have complex conversations online, but um, I think we're all getting better at it. So those are sort of the two things that I would that I would throw out. I agree. 
Um, other than the fact that uh, I'm sorry for the room noise because I'm like running several fans at once because it's so hot in New York right now. Um, I, I agree entirely. Um, and I, would, I, so as much as like I miss, um, I miss everything about before. Uh, but uh, I would say that like Zoom is an interesting case. Zoom is a very, very interesting case about what it means um, to respond to be responsible to a variety of communities. And one thing that I think was really interesting was how Zoom responded to um, a lot of criticism that they received from like the information security community as well as the privacy um, advocacy community regarding you know like uh, choosing to have your data served from you know your country of origin, for instance. Um, end-to-end -end encryption and actually having it rather than saying that you have it and not having it. Um, bug bounties, transparency, et cetera. And not only did Zoom have to um, really, really demonstrate that they had the capacity to carry the world's conversations all at once, like, like that, um, but they also had to prove that they could engage in these conversations. And you know, with none of it is perfect, Zoom is not doing a perfect job at it, but like it was really admirable to see them trying and to see them actually like doing more than paying lip service to it. So that said, like I'm still going to use like I still recommend using Jitsi. Um, I recommend running your own Jitsi server. That's fun. Big uh, blue button is open source. That's cool. All of those things. Um, we have plenty of choices out there, but from like a overreaching corporate perspective, Zoom did a pretty remarkable job. Yeah. I feel, I feel like uh, with uh, COVID nineteen, a little bit falling on what people are saying. You know, like uh, a lot of like was was um, also like a the pandemic created. I believe in my in my way, or like a baseline to compare everywhere around the world. You know, like how this country is doing, how that country is doing with it, how this country is doing with it, and then you know you also see, um, like I said, you know the mindset. What is the mindset? Is people first? You know, is safety first? You know, what is the mindset? Is the economy first? Are we worried about the economy? You know, like, oh, the economy is going to collapse if we do this, we do that. So I feel like you, you, you see the priorities and you also see the priorities from the past because everybody was caught, right? Like, so if you had invested in a healthcare system that is universal and free for everyone, you know, you, you probably had like a better way of handling it, you know, than uh, even to coordinate data, talking about data, you know, like, I'm here in New York too, and they're like, they're talking, oh, the new and uh, hospital system, everybody's private, everybody does their own thing, even to coordinate that they had to move patients around because the, the badge was overwhelming, you know, like was complicated. So you have uh, the GNU Health System, which is an amazing free software to manage hospitals who manage countries, like the whole Jamaica country, uh, healthcare system is run by free software. <laughs> so here we go, you know, like the, the, um, World uh, Health Association uh, Organization, you know, from the UN, they use that free software, you know, on the missions and stuff. So that are solutions that could universe the, you know, like the way things operate to make it easier. But anyways, I think like it's, it showed what the priority was for a while, you know, and exposed it a lot of information. Again, talking about data, we saw who got hurt the most, you know, during the pandemic, you know, like is the poor, you know, is the people of color. We saw all of that, you know, who died the most, um, and uh, who lost the jobs the most. So I think um, we, um, I, I, go, I go to these examples about like, you know, when the big companies are making the, the choices, what are the motivations? And like, it's great that Zoom did the jump, you know, and they reacted because they knew also they will lose the market share for whoever would jump and do it, you know, and say it, I'm safer, I'm more secure. I don't have people jumping and hijacking conversations, you know, and all of that, you know, like, uh, so they had to jump. And it's the same way uh, that people came to see convention technology, because if the service is blocked in a country, people will jump to another service that is not blocked, you know, like uh, that, you know, like that happened with WhatsApp and Telegram in Brazil. WhatsApp was blocked, Telegram got like 100,000 new users, <laughs> I don't know, like, but that was a jump, you know? So I think like, uh, you know, fortunately that is this type of motivation too, you know? Um, but going back to coronavirus um, and COVID-19, um, I believe like talking about the use of data, you know, and the right use of data and how you can actually like have a, a good practices on 
you know, especially in a pandemic where you actually to tra have to track people and know, you know, the interactions you had, which is super privacy invasive, you can actually build a system and build like a process of doing so that is like we, we've been talking about from the beginning, privacy by design that has like the, the privacy of the, the patient and the, the users as like a, a big a, a importance, um, uh, importance requirement for what you're building, for the solution that you're pitching, that you're proposing, you know? Did the government care about having that requirement as a high level on the list of requirements when they were doing the bid and Trilo in New York got the bid? I don't know, but like, that's what I'm saying. It goes back to like, what are the motivations, you know? What are like, uh, we need to have people first on every level, on the coronavirus levels, on privacy, on technology level, you know, like even how you make money level, you know, like you need to do that, you know? So uh, we might not have noticed, but we're actually moving into the optimism uh, phase of the panel where we talk about uh, how things can become uh, uh, better in some sense. So I've got one, uh, uh, we've been talking uh, sort of at a high level in generalities, uh, and then every so often we, we throw out concrete examples like onion share and so on. So there are a bunch of people watching this all around the world. How, how can they learn to recognize privacy by design? How do they know which tools to trust? So one answer is be a journalist and go to Harlow's training. And she tells you, great. But what if you aren't at Harlow's training? Like how, what, what helpful things can we do to point people in the right direction? Uh, I totally agree that, that giving people intuition so they can assess a new tool and decide for themselves if it's safe is the right long-term answer. Uh, but what are some what are some things that our actual audience members at RightsCon can do right now to, to get closer to that? Um, I, like I said before, right, like uh, if you, you can browse the internet with an extremely high privacy level using Tor browser. Uh, uh, Firefox has a different level of protection, but this has really nice add-ons, like the Facebook container is a great one that I throw out there. You know, and I feel like there are other browsers too, Brave is one, you know, but I think uh, um, in terms of browsing, like top browser exists for Android, for desktop, and if you want for iOS, it's a long conversation, but that is a, pro a project called Onion Browser that we recommend and uh, will not provide 100% the same uh, features that we have on the Fire on our top browser because it's, something that we can modify and control. In iOS, we cannot. But it gets really close to uh, protection and at least allows you to bypass censorship for sure, you know, if you are, you know, trying to access uh, some website that's blocked. I'm going to let other people jump in. Now that I did my, you know, my advertising, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, on, like, uh, the more broader um, scale, like, one... Um, privilege open source. So like, I don't know where my life would be if like I didn't have, if I didn't discover Tor like all those years ago. So first, and, and that gave me an appreciation for open source software and its process and the, um, the communities that build these tools. Um, that's one where you're not going open source and the vast majority of things that you do will not involve open source tools. I always like the people uh, to imagine like the money, where the money is coming from. Um, that old adage, if you aren't paying for the product, you are the product, like that is evergreen and it's like, it's here to stay. Um, and third, uh, when you're bored, have a look at your private, like just, you know, click the gears, look at the privacy and security settings and ask yourself what those implications mean. Um, I, uh, I always do that every time, you know, like a, a new app is, is in my hands. Haley, do you have anything to add for us? Um, I mean, uh, let's see. I, I, I would also say, like, don't, I mean, maybe this community is not uh, the right community, but, you know, I, I used to be a consumer tech reporter. And so I was, you know, getting emails from grandparents in Reston, Virginia or whatever, right? And it's like, don't be scared of the tools that are out there. Like, really, they're not terrifying. You can use them. Um, the world has not passed you by. Privacy is not beyond your technical grasp. So just remembering that. Um, is really important and finding guides because a lot of them exist out there. Yes, EFF has a great guide, uh, surveillance, self-defense. Google it. 
<laughs> Google, dug, dug, go it, like search for it. So many of the tools in our space. Ha so, so we talked about the surveillance capitalism model of build a huge data set, become a huge company, uh, profit. Uh, a lot of tools in our space do the nonprofit thing, where we spend all of our time writing grant proposals to large organizations that uh, that create more and more bureaucracy because they don't have enough money and too many people want it. Uh, so you end up writing a proposal, and then nine months later, maybe you get your funding. Uh, is are those the two choices? Uh, is there something else? Do we need to change the the funding model? I guess there's the EFF. I see Haley uh, thinking about this. I guess there's the EFF model of get all the people around the world to send you 20 bucks uh, and, and hope that adds up enough. So I guess those are, those are three approaches. Uh, is there more? Uh, is that, is that enough? How do we, how do we fix the, the sustainability in our space? You forgot to mention really nice sweatshirts. Yeah. Yes, I did. You're right. Oh, money. Yes. Uh, so diversi diversify funds is extremely important. You know, I think uh, the grants will always be there, but we can always be on the grants, you know, and that's why we try to increase the direct donations. And in terms of organization, there are developing software and yes, I develop like supports development of software as well. You know, like it, it is really hard because uh, with the grants life that I call it, because the grant life, like every time you have an idea, you cannot execute that idea right away. You know, you need to have the turnaround time that might take like six to eight months for you to start executing that idea. And everyone, anyone on the software business know that, you know, this is how people used to do in the 80s and they learned that it's not the right thing. I mean, you had to be agile, you had to be able to execute your idea when you have the idea. You know, you cannot have like a, this uh, forever, uh, roadmap that, you know, I'm planning something that I'm going to do a year from now. And that's not the right way, especially for software development. So that's why um, the EFF model of small support, uh, supporters is doing that to, you know, like I think like the donations that people give, when you're giving donations, um, even if it's small, big, whatever, and, you know, the private sector can also contribute, you know, like give donations. But like when you're giving donations, you are allowing the organization to be agile, to respond fast, you know, to execute the idea that they're having right away and to not delay on that process. So for us, it's extremely important type of support. So we have a couple of minutes left and I promised people some optimism. So uh, I guess the question for each of you and, and be uh, somewhat quick is we talked about GDPR, we've talked about uh, governments and laws. We talked about technology that can keep people safe, that they can use independent of what the laws are. Uh, what, how, how do we, where do you see this ending? How, and how do we get there? Okay, I can say something really quick. There is no law, there is no technology that will change everything. We need to also act, you know, it's on us too. And, you know, and if we don't like get out of out there, you know, like get out of the sofa, organize and act, you know, like it's not going to do it by itself. No law and no technology is going to do it by itself. We need to also act, you know. Arlo, Haley, last thoughts? Um, no, I think that's absolutely right. And, you know, we don't all have to agree on taking on one piece of this problem at a time. Like it's really important actually that we have a, we're attacking it from all angles. And so, um, you know, Act about the thing that you care the most about because that comes through. Yeah. Um, I would, uh, I guess, conclude by saying that um, uh, another thing that I do is I, I teach uh, a course um, at NYU about um, just kind of how like digital security works and why it's been important to our, um, to, uh, our corner of like the internet freedom community. Uh, I've had Roger come to my class actually once. Um, but uh, I think like giving people an appreciation of uh, the story as it was like, you know, like taught to me when I was younger um, and keeping that story going is really important as well. Because like hackers are going to need to care like about why the software is built the way it is. And so much of that is part of the story. Community. Community is an excellent word to, to end this on. So I'd like to thank our uh, three speakers and 
the audience for providing a, a long pile of chat questions, which are still there, and we can go and answer some more of those uh, after this. But thank you, everybody, for participating, and we will see you at the next session. Thank you, Roger, for moderating. Thanks so much, Roger. Thank you.